there is a scientific forecasting method, and it's well described in the uh, web page that I linked to this slide. And basically, there are 139 principles that are used to summarize knowledge about forecasting. If you're going to have a forecast that is a truly scientific forecast, in other words, not just most of it being guesswork, you're supposed to actually follow basic principles. Okay? They cover things like this, formulating a problem, obtaining information about it, selecting and applying methods, evaluating methods, and using the forecast. And each principle is described along with its purpose in the document that I was just talking about. So why do you need 139 principles? Well, the truth is you don't need them all in every circumstance. You know, for stock market, for example, you might not be looking at uh, political influence. I mean, that may not be a factor. Or corn growth, well, it might be if you're an MP from a corn region and you're trying to show that you're doing well. But regardless, you don't need 139 for every uh, forecast that you're doing. You have to look at the forecast and read the principles and see which ones you think uh, are necessary. And I just picked a few to show you what typical principles of forecasting are if you're doing scientific forecasting. And of course that's what we want. We don't want to just have it kind of by guess, by guess or by golly. Um, we have to make sure that the forecasts are independent of politics, okay? Uh, obtain decision makers agreements on methods. That's quite important because if you're going to have certain methods for forecasting and the decision makers are going to just ignore you later, then, you know, you better talk to them about it before you start. Um, avoid biased data sources, okay? These are all fairly obvious principles. In many cases, um, import, obtain all the important data, okay? The most recent data. This one I think is really crucially important. Ask unbiased experts to rate potential methods. And that's the beauty of what I'm about to show you, is two unbiased experts who are experts in forecasting. They're not experts in climate. They actually rated the IPCC to see how well they follow these forecast principles, okay? And I'm not talking about whether their science is right, but whether their actual methodology for doing forecasts actually follows the rules. And here is what they concluded. Keston Green, uh, a lecturer at the University of South Australia, and Professor Armstrong, a leader of forecasting actually at the University of Pennsylvania, they actually assessed the IPCC's approach to forecasting. And that's what they said. They violate 72, and they list them all. There's links in here where you can look it up. Uh, they violate 72 of the basic principles of forecasting. And they say that when they read the IPCC documents, there is no indication that the IPCC scientists and bureaucrats even know that there are principles of scientific forecasting. So here's what they conclude. I'll just let you read that. So what do you say to that? It's not proper to claim that these are truly scientific forecasts. My goodness. We're talking about forecasts of the world's top scientists, and they don't use scientific forecasts. Anyway, you can read that. And down here is something pretty awesome. Um, Professor Armstrong, actually, he's, these are both advisors to the ICSC. I recruited them into our group right away because, I mean, these are the world's experts in actual forecasting methods. And what he did is he said, I wonder how good the IPCC's best models, you know, the ones they use, because the IPCC themselves don't actually make computer models, but the ones that they use um, and cite papers from, et cetera, he said, I wonder how good those models are in comparison with what's called the naive model. Now, a naive model works like this. It just basically says that you start in one year, and for all time horizons, you forecast that there is no temperature change. In other words, you start in the year 1850, and you take what is the real temperature in 1850, and you forecast that it will be the same in 1851 and in 1852, and in 1860, and 1890, all the way up for 100 years, okay? So that's 100 forecasts, all assuming the temperature doesn't stay, uh, doesn't change from 1850. Then you go to 1851, and you take what is the real temperature in 1851, and you do the same forecast. And so you can see if you do that in 100 years, you're going to end up with 5,000 forecasts, okay? So they took that forecast, and they call that method the naive model. Okay, the naive model assumes that starting in every year, for all time horizons, there's no temperature change. And they took that and they compared it with the very best models that are used by the IPCC, which remember we spend hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money on. They compared that, um, the naive model, with the IPCC model, and as they describe in the paper, which you can click on underneath the uh, slide here, 
the naive model gave results that were seven times better, and they define what that means in the paper, than the IPCC's best models. So, you know, it's funny, when I'm in different cities, when I have to go and give presentations, I always like talking to taxi drivers because they have, you know, sort of really good, solid common sense. And when I was in Copenhagen, one of the taxi drivers, he said, well, what do you think, you know, are we headed to this great climate catastrophe? What's going to happen? And I said, oh, well, I don't think things will change much. And, and he said, well, what do you mean? All these models show this. I said, and so I told him, I said, well, do you realize if you forecast no change, you're going to get a lot more accurate result than if you use the absolute best of the IPCC models. <laughs> and, you know, usually that leads to some interesting dead silence on the part of the driver. Uh, and by the time he's out, he's got my business card and it's, you know, I got another supporter. So it's sort of fun. But, but I find it's just astounding that people put so much faith in this particular approach of the IPCC to forecast uh, climate when, in fact, the naive model gives much better results. Um, so what uh, Scott Armstrong did, and it's right here on this web page called theclimatebet.com, is he contacted Al Gore's office and he said, look, I'm going to use my, my uh, naive model here, and I, I'd like Mr. Gore to take a bet, okay? Let Mr. Gore choose the absolute best model he wants, and I'll bet my naive model will beat him. And at first, Gore's office was actually interested, and they were going to take the bet. And I don't know, it's going to be $1,000 or something. It's nothing to Al Gore. It probably wouldn't mean a lot to Armstrong. But anyway, uh, after they looked at Armstrong's papers and stuff, they stopped returning his phone calls. <laughs> and so as things stand, um, that was about three or four years ago, they never did finalize the bet. But on this website, what he's done is he said, well, if Mr. Gore took the bet, um, who would be winning? <laughs> And so far, every year, the naive model is beating, you know, all the best IPCC models, which might be why Mr. Gore didn't take the bet. <laughs>